This is episode four of the Three Buddy Problem, a podcast within the Security Conversations Network. Costin Ryu is back from his fancy schmancy vacation in Santorini, uh, ready to weigh in on the news this week. Juan, where are you this week? I'm in DC. I'm back home. Uh, let's jump right into the news this week, guys. It's it's what? 8, 11 a.m. on Friday, July 12th, and uh, AT&T just posted an SEC filing, sorry, confirming a massive call logs breach, uh, hinting that an arrest is coming, uh, CNN story connecting it to the snowflake incident, snowflake breach, whatever we're calling that. Uh, how significant is this one right off the bat when you see the at and uh, uh, filing? What comes to mind? Well, it continues to drive sort of this general bewilderment about the, uh, the snowflake incident, right? Like we were talking about this a little bit earlier, sort of trying to figure out why folks keep calling it a snowflake breach, I, you know, to what extent I guess that, that word is sort of being overutilized in, in, in a sense. But um, on the AT&T part, let, let's take a minute to actually appreciate AT&T. Like, they do have a really good research like research security team. They're super, like, forward-leaning. Like, even looking at this filing, I, I understand that no one's ever happy to see more data sort of go out into this already vast embarrassment of breaches, if you will. But they're really, I mean, they're pretty on top of it, what they're describing. Like, right, what kind of data actually went out, what kind of call records, what kind of, you know... Uh, they're even very proactive about saying, hey, yeah, it doesn't come out with like, there's information about your phone number and stuff, but it, it, it doesn't include who the customer is. But let's be honest, you could get that information easily on the internet, right? Like, I appreciate that from AT&T as a sort there's of There's a certain mature. shortrightness to it. Yeah, there's a, there's a maturity to it that I wish we would see with more organizations. So like, first and foremost, credit to AT&T. And then I think it's sort of whatever sort of the mystery is around who might have gotten uh, apprehended so far. It really just keeps pointing back to this snowflake breach or incident that, you know, was also sort of the Ticketmaster mess. And like, there's a lot of, of downstream incidents that are coming from that. One of the things from the ticket, one of the things from the snowflake breach, snowflake incident, as, as I understand it, and help me understand it from your, your perspective, is snowflake is not party to blame here. Customers have uh, their passwords compromised and they have not enabled multi-factor authentication or they have not properly configured their Snowflake instances. And now they've gotten breached and it becomes blamed as a Snowflake breach when, you know, Snowflake has had Mandiant and some others come out and say, hey, this has nothing to do with Snowflake. These are customers not configuring the thing properly. We're in this kind of shared fate, shared responsibility thing where whose who's, who's fault it is, whose blame it is, always comes to the fore. In this case, there's AT&T saying nearly all of our customers, all this metadata and all of these kind of call records are just gone and it's all connected to this bridge. Like how do we how do we balance this story? It almost feels like Snowflake is kind of taking it on the chin the way good good service providers do, right? Like when you, what you just described, uh, to some extent, it's like the, the real issue here seems to be the prevalence of um, stealers and the amount of sort of credentials that you can get these days from stealers. And then, of course, we can have conversations about MFA and whatnot. But I, I think that's also why we're struggling to some extent to say, well, is this uh, is this a breach? Is this, you know, just sort of like... Why are we describing this as well? There was some credential harvesting, and um, well, there and are a ton of able breaches. to get way more access to it. Yeah, there are a ton of breaches happening. This data is lost. This data is compromised. You 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 mentioned stealers, costing every username and password is compromised at some point, and it's sitting in some database in some leak site somewhere. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that the the best way to think about uh, well the so-called snowflake breach if you want but uh, in general about all these uh, incidents including the AT&T incident from today is there's two dimensions two big uh, dimensions let's say to the um, problems that we have in security at the moment and those are one cloud people just dumping tons of data into the cloud and two stealers and when you combine these two things together there's suddenly like a uh, huge throws of information uh, being made available with things as simple as a username uh, and the password. And uh, this username and passwords, you know, getting synchronized from one device to, to another through Google accounts, for instance, is another risk which just adds to the complexity uh, to how difficult it is actually uh, to secure all your premises and even your like enterprise logs if they are um, in databases um, similar to Snowflake. 
Can I push back a little bit? Is it really difficult? We're in 2024. There's mandatory multi-factor mm-hmm. authentication. There are mitigations and roadblocks and all kinds of things built into these systems, right? If the vendor, like, when we go back to the secure by design, secure by default uh, portion mm-hmm. conversation we've just been having, if the vendor pushes out something and says, here, you, you use this, but you need to protect five different little things to make sure the data is at least, there's some mitigation to loss of the data. How is the vendor to blame? And again, you, you're making it sound like these roadblocks are not already in place. You're right. It would be almost like yeah, calling uh, something the Google breach. Yeah, like somebody got access to your Google Drive because your username and password, you know, got leaked. So that's a Google that, breach. It's not the That's Google what I'm breach, thinking, right? right? Yeah. Like, why do we keep going back to this, like, snowflake? Sorry. I understand that the data is coming from Snowflake. I get it. But like, Kosin, to your point, right? Like, we, we don't talk about it that way when it's just like somebody stole my creds, went into my Google Drive. Is it yeah. because of the amount of data? Is it because yeah. we're talking about sort of production systems that carry that much? Yeah, I think uh, probably like um, the, the top issue here and what people have been complaining was that uh, two-factor authentication wasn't uh, enabled by default or wasn't uh, being forced uh, by default. So that, um, I would say, was uh, one of the top issues. Maybe uh, remember like the the old uh, talk um, uh, back in the days about evil default. So that that would be for sure kind of an evil default. And the other thing, um, uh, which uh, it's it's a bit uh, sad and funny at the same time, is how these uh, security measures, they kind of happen in waves. Um, Like many years ago, for instance, um, uh, I'll give you an example. My bank uh, shipped everyone... uh, Uh, hardware tokens for authentication so like those kind of uh, physical hardware tokens that you can use in order to log in into your banking account so it was kind of sad and funny at the same time that a few days ago they just told everyone that we we we're getting rid of these tokens and instead we're going to switch to sms authentication whenever you log in you get an sms I mean, like, seriously, how, how is it like we go back, like, we have a secure solution, we go back to a one that is worse, you know, probably bad things will happen, so they'll have to switch back. So everything just happens in waves and loop cycles. I want to add one thing it's before a... you jump in, Juan, just to close sure. the loop on, on, on the MFA and the Snowflake side. Just this week, Snowflake announced that they're going to make uh, MFA mandatory on certain things and certain accounts and so on. So, which brings me back to the point, like, is that really a secure by default product you ship if now you're turning on a mandatory MFA, right? And how much of that responsibility? Shouldn't you have turned that on four years ago? And if they were complex, if there were complex roadblocks to turning it on, then why are, why aren't those roadblocks in place now? And why isn't this the standard thing? Like, look, man, this is one of those things. Where, remember when we were talking to, to Dave, uh, I tell last episode, uh, he talked about how like the purity pledge was uh, the the CISA pledge was a way for uh, supporting internal asks. Uh, this is one where you know I don't know why I'm like a snowflake apologist, but like <laughs> I, I don't I don't really want to look at them and be like why didn't you do it before? Because frankly, I think anyone here who's worked at a big com- like big company that has to do any kind of product thing knows this conversation. It's like anything that act adds friction to the user, anything that adds friction to the experience of having your product used is basically a non-starter and a huge uphill battle. Uh, And you would be surprised in the security space how much of a battle that is, as jaded as we are. But even something as small, like we're just talking about multi-factor, right? Like Kosin was talking about hardware tokens. Hardware tokens are amazing. Hardware tokens are, you know, what we wish we wish there was a hardware component to all of this MFA. So the idea that a bank was willing to ship hardware tokens, even though they are the highest friction possible measure in a way for users, uh, is admirable. I am not surprised that however long after someone else won that battle and you roll that back to one of the more insecure versions of MFA. Sort of to, to set up an antagonist or set up a contrast to Snowflake, you could look at the Sysense breach. The Sysense breach was, that incident was not, oh, you know, somebody's got your creds. That one was, oh, we put everything in an insecure place and an attacker actually went and grabbed every token that we as a company were using to access and connect to your databases and cloud instances and whatnot and that one was bad and that one did not have the kind of follow-up that we're seeing here nor did it have the kind of responsibility that we'd expect so i do think you know the same way that i'm looking at at&t and going like look at how forthright they are 
And like I look at Snowflake and go, well, they're taking it on the chin for their customers. I look at Slicense and I go, what the hell happened over there, right? Yeah, that story is already gone under the radar. No one even remembers uh, <laughs> because this Because the right exists. people got involved in the very beginning. But that's one of those where like the security community avoided a cataclysmic disaster. And yet you still see side effects from it. Like there are third and fourth party incidents that have come from that. But is that our reality moving forward, that we're just going to have these third and fourth party incidents happening and the vendors are just going to be, you know, responding to it here and there and we're not going to hold them accountable because, okay, it's not really their fault that the customer is not using it securely. Like, where does this, where do we go from here? I, I think it absolutely is, has been and will continue to be our reality, particularly in a cloud first paradigm where there are no standards or responsibilities that are actually heaped on cloud service providers, right? Like it, it comes down provider to provider, right? Like tomorrow, Microsoft can decide to be the most forthright, most stand up provider ever. And Amazon can decide that they're just like going to have all these incidents. That they're never going to tell anybody. And there's no pressure heaped on either of them, right? Like that's what the 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 intro to the national cyber strategy so accurately pointed out right like the economics of the situation right now favor uh the ones that are moving fast fixing nothing letting everything break way above anybody who's taking the time to do security properly and try to be stand up about it where i think there may be some eventual silver lining is as as more of these incidents continue to impact brand, PR, stock, et cetera, for downstream customers, I can see security taking on that premium, particularly in the cloud space where you go, well, uh, I could pay any one of these providers, but Snowflake, when this happened at Snowflake, they actually stood in front of their customers as a shield and didn't let the brand damage kind of fall downstream. So I'm going to go with them, right? Like I could see the, the market starting to incentivize that notion, even if it is just, hey, you know, take a bullet for me. But hopefully it becomes a, hey, you have all the right defaults in place and I can actually trust the service that you're providing. I mean, that, that's sort of like a utopia I'd like to dream of on this Friday, right? This sounds like an untractable problem though, Kostin. It feels like this is just our reality moving uh, forward. Well, I wanted, by the way, I wanted to go back a bit to the to the at and breach and just to, to ask you guys what you're thinking about. They were like, Two items there, like related to this story, which attracted my attention. One of them was that AT and T became aware of this, uh, I think, in May, and the government asked incidents. them to delay. Right? Yeah, the, I the, mean, as yeah, I read they, it, there are two incidents there described. There were two, absolutely. Uh, but they became aware of this in May, and the government asked them to delay the reporting for two months. Yeah, so it's in, it's interesting. The government asked them for, uh, to delay it for, for two months. So one of the questions would be like, uh, why would the government ask, ask uh, something like that? And the other one, which attracted my attention, there's like a lot of uh, emphasis on the fact that uh, the content of these messages and calls, you know, was not uh, disclosed. It's all metadata. And I was thinking, uh, I was remembering, uh, was it Michael Hayden who said that we kill people based on metadata, right? Uh, it's a famous quote from him. Uh, so what do, you, what do you think about the fact it's just metadata? How serious is that? Like, if it's just metadata, is it like still, should we care about or not? Like, what do you guys think about these and two me, points? And let me, let me ask the obvious question. Is there like a nation state, uh, is there a nation state linkage here? considering uh, what they've gotten a hold of. I, I think, um, I mean, there, there's several questions there, uh, all of them meaningful. So on the, you know, asking to delay part of it, my assumption was when you're saying, hey, somebody's been apprehended for this, is that, you know, who knows, maybe they were already investigating this, they wanted to arrest somebody, they said, hey, please, you know, don't just yet. And that's my absolute guess. Now, talking about the, the call records, there is a big market around this. There is a lot of interest around uh, that kind of metadata. And, and to your point, Kostin, um, we kill people based on metadata. To be honest, I think anybody who's ever thought of what the design is like for um, any kind of uh, dragnet surveillance or any kind of sort of like telephony based SIGINT, metadata is 90% of what you care about, right? Like that's where you know uh, who's talking to whom, how long, from where, you know, when and how, what their devices are, where their devices are located. That stuff is, in my view, the majority of the, the, the pattern of life 
uh, act, you know, activity that you're going to be analyzing and that you're interested in. And then the content of the conversations is the sprinkles, right? Like if you can get it, if you want to get it, if you want to hit that health, if you want to target somebody with your Pegasus style implant, you start with that metadata, you know what device they have, you know who they're talking to. Maybe you don't even target their device, but you go, well, Kostin calls his wife every night. Let's target her device and let's just listen into what his day is like, right? Like there's a lot of filtering down that happens on the basis of that information. So when I look at something like this, I'm not saying that this particular incident has a nation state tie in, but that information is absolutely what nation state SIGINT agencies are interested in and, and what they should be interested in. Otherwise, once again, you're talking about hoovering up an amount of data that you just have no way of operationalizing in a timely or effective fashion. Another thing that popped out of me from the 8K filing was um, AT&T making it clear. Let, let, me, let me just read the line, the two lines that pop out and, and the fact that it's not almost all of their customers. It says, current analysis indicates that the data includes for these periods of time records of calls and texts of nearly all of AT&T wireless customers and customers of mobile virtual network operators, these MVNOs that use AT&T wireless network. The records identify the telephone numbers for telephone numbers with which an AT&T or this MVNO wireless number interacted, telephone numbers of AT&T wireless customers and customers of other carriers, the counts of these interactions, the aggregate call duration for a day or a month. So there's like a rich trove of things. So the, the, let me just get the obvious question out of the way. If you had to guess, the, is the threat actor here and uh, uh, the adversary here a nation state, uh, one of those hoovering up for, for intelligence purposes, or is this a uh, cyber criminal looking to resell? It, it's. I think those two things are not necessarily connected because of the opportunistic nature of having this sort of snowflake incident in the middle of it, right? Like if you were telling me, if we were discussing Light Basin as a threat actor that has been specifically going after stuff like that, we could be having a conversation about who that threat actor is on the basis of the data they've gone, you know, they've been moving towards. In this case, if you tell me, you know, somebody left the keys to a Lambo on the side of, you know, on the side of the road, and then a kid walks up and steals a Lambo, having a conversation about whether that kid meant to steal a Lambo in particular as opposed to any other kind of car, it, you know, it, to I'm me, it's not I'm asking you to make a guess. guess. I'm asking no, you I to think, make a guess. Do you think well, this is opportunistic? I'm, I'm, I think this is opportunistic on the basis of where the access comes from, but what you're describing happens to be uh, the kind of data that the higher end groups and, and organizations have wanted, will continue to want, would happily buy, right? Like it's the kind of data that is the bread and butter of modern signals intelligence. So, Austin, who is the adversary here? Because he's hedging and hedging. I don't know why he's hedging. So well, they, much. they got arrested, dude. Like, if they if they apprehended anyone in the middle of this thing, like you already know, we're talking at best. If you want to go high end, it's a reseller, right? Like, but most likely, it's some seventeen year old who like took advantage of the snowflake thing. Noticeably, as well, the information was not posted on a leak site. I, as, far, as far as I read it, at and found out privately on their own, uh, independently of it being publicly leaked. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. And Costin, who's your guess that the adversary is here? You think this is an opportunistic teenager? Uh, yeah, I would say it's opportunistic. Uh, and I um, judge my, you know, I base my judgment on the fact that there's no discussions yet of like uh, malware being involved, like sophisticated tools. I would say it was uh, most likely... Uh, some kind of uh, cyber criminal, maybe like, a, yeah, like a teenager, as you said, maybe hopefully, you know, I hope it's one of the um, Octo Tempest guys, like considering they got arrested, they're probably in the US or like somewhere nearby. They're definitely probably not in Russia uh, because they wouldn't get arrested that easily. So that's, so that's what I suspect. All right. Can we move on? We got a lot to get to. We're already 20 minutes in and we haven't touched on any of the other. We just touched on the breaking story with AT&T. So we think it's an opportunistic thing. It's significant. The kind of data that nation state adversaries would, would mm -hmm. dream of. Hopefully they've got that on the wraps. Costin, you want to say can something I, to wrap it up? Can I, fi can I finish just, just with one question? I, I will leave an open question, which is why were those logs in that Snowflake instance, like just sitting there, like this kind of logs, metadata? Was it because they were being made available to someone else? I'm just going to drop this question there. Oh, Let, you get no, 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 you can't just leave that. Because like it makes it sound so nefarious, but... <laughs> 
let, let's let's remind ourselves and like let, let me can, can i stop you for a moment and just yeah please, you that. please two thousand what was it? 2000 uh, uh 2008 2008 2009 when rsa announced they got breached and the attackers managed to um steal the private keys for like uh tens of thousands of uh, harder token right and like everyone was like freaking out and my question back then was like why was rsa storing the private keys for all these harder devices like in the first place so the question i'm asking now why were these logs being stored there like in, in right but you're asking the question in a why are they deliberately being put there right well, it's a data warehouse right like that's their whole service so let Look, I I just don't want I mean, it to sound more nefarious than it is because we have to remember that this is all hearkening back to how poorly designed the the enduring sort of like telephony mechanism is, right? Like when when we talk about SS7 and all of the nightmares of SS7, so much of that it's like it's the Microsoft problem, right? Like you have legacy on top of legacy on top of legacy systems for a global network that somehow has to have interoperability. That's why like when they talk about like the MVNOs and you're like, well, somebody was sort of like abusing a virtual provider or maybe somebody was roaming, maybe somebody like this whole global mobile network has to somehow connect to itself and, and be able to say, oh, Ryan is currently in Mexico with his AT&T line and it has to work. So, you know, I don't I just don't want to I don't want to make it sound more nefarious than it is that they have a data warehouse that where they were putting logs that are an important part of how the whole mobile network works, how they do billing, how how interoperability works. Um, and to that effect, I would actually point out, like, maybe we should try to get Mark Rogers over here because he's one of the, the few people that, like, really understands how this SS7, like, nightmare fuel works. It's not, I, I don't think it's any more nefarious in that particular case than saying this is just how this stuff functions. Let's just not forget um, that these kind of logs are probably a goldmine for advertisers, for uh, marketing companies. And I think there's been uh, stories in the past that uh, these kind of logs, exactly this kind of metadata was being made available for sale uh, in a commercial manner, in a legitimate manner even. Um, to advertisers for all sorts of purposes. So yeah. and then being I, purchased I, by law enforcement agencies for operations. <laughs> well, and then used the, the, for which other they things. Could, right? Like it, honestly, that that's where a lot of sort of the the widen uh, fear factor sets in for the U.S. organizations and not for anybody else. Right? Like I I see the U.S. Uh, intelligence community very hamstrung, whereas like I don't know. Uh, Mexican SIGINT could come and buy all these commercial things and have a wonderful time. And to that effect, like, guys, if tomorrow the three of us were barred from the threat intel space whatsoever, the first thing I would do is go try to get a bunch of VC funding and just buy a bunch of these call records and, like, ad tech data and set up a Snowflake instance. And I bet you, like, the amount of, like, interconnections that you can make on the basis of that metadata for advertising and a series of other things is phenomenal, right? Like, that would be the next frontier for the three-buddy, I don't know, uh, privacy-destroying company, right? I want to pivot to a story that made the rounds this week. And again, it feels like a yawn. Another one is Apple notifying surveillance spyware targets around the world. 98 countries, sorry. Uh, uh, notification in 98 countries warning them of this potential mercenary spyware attacks. Costin, have you ever gotten one of these? I, I have not, but I know people who got such notification on their phones, uh, and I've been working with victims who got such notifications. I think I mentioned this before through my uh, think tank. I've been helping victims of uh, Pegasus, and uh, I think it's pretty scary. It's pretty scary when you when one of these they just pop up on your phone, and it is pretty scary. Because, well, let me ask um, the question then. When when this thing pops up on your phone, what does it say mm -hmm. and what does it tell you to mm -hmm. do? Like if I get it on my phone, if I get one of these, what am I seeing and what is my mm -hmm. response? Um, well, on, on one hand, props to Apple for sending these notifications because I think it should be kind of standard. I, I, I guess now more and more companies are doing this. I, I would love, for instance, for Microsoft to do this. Uh, in a systematic way because I at the same time like whenever a story like this hits the news um, I would say it impacts it uh, impacts a company's reputation just admitting that your users have been uh, targeted by sophisticated spyware it just affects your image of uh, you know 
Apple doesn't get malware, Apple doesn't get virus, Apple products are secure. So yeah, on one hand, props to them for doing the notifications. Now, on the content of these messages themselves, I, I think they could be done better. The worst thing, in my opinion, they don't tell you exactly what it was. They don't tell you it was what Pegasus. What did they tell you? Don't... Help me understand what you see. Um, because it says to the, me, take well, uh, you, you've been a target, please take this seriously. Okay, now what do I do? Yeah, like, what? yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it has certain limitations. So for sure, on one hand, it doesn't tell you who was targeting you or why. And secondly, I think it doesn't tell you exactly um, how. And uh, moreover, it's some kind of a lawyer language in, in which they say, well, we have indications that you may have been the target yeah, of nation state. Hedging, so it? that's like a yeah, super super lawyerish uh, uh, text. Um, so I think most people will be very confused. Um, there's no clear instructions like what do you want to do next. Yeah, of course, um, people can enable lockdown mode and so on and ask for professional help. But like the question is, where do you ask for professional help? And if you enable lockdown mode, is that enough? Uh, does it uh, actually solve all your problems or like in reality you have a much bigger problem and the much bigger problem is that uh, these attacks will not stop in the future there'll be more so what do you do in the future uh, so i think yeah there's a lot of uh, open questions here and uh, it, could, it could be done better but at the same time i i like the fact that apple's doing that I'm, I'm glad they're doing it because they've made everything else so hard that at least there's that look i'm, I'm happy to see this wave of notifications on a personal level because my hope is that that means Claudio Guarneri, who is now at Apple, is continuing to do this work, is being given the latitude to take this on seriously. And I, look, I, I, it's not like I know Claudio super well, but I'll say that he's got a track record of being irascible and not compromising. And I trust that he'll go down swinging, right? Like if anyone is going to, try to to get apple to stand by and, and do something big and significant with this I, I trust that he will or that he'll try um so that's great now on the content of the notifications i feel about this similarly to the the gmail like google notifications which i find much even more hopeless than this situation right like at least in this case right so you get a notification on your phone you've been targeted by a nation state and then you don't know what the hell to do, but you can at least take that phone to Kosin or to someone in Citizen Lab. This is, or that is not say, fair, though. That is not fair that you can just like someone, everyone who gets this thing can have access to a Kostin or a Citizen oh, Lab. That no, is no. just as useless as the Google one. It, Come on. No, you no, guys no, are giving no. Apple kudos that to is, say, hey, you've been that is Take it seriously. Marginally, it's marginally less useless because... I at least have the phone, and if I'm lucky enough to have access to somebody, maybe we can follow up. With the Google one, they just go, you've been targeted, and you go, okay, can you, like, show me the spam or tell me an IP or, like, look, I have an army, I have Mandy, and I have an army of people here who are going to help me. I have resources, and they go, well, good luck with that. But and Apple then they just like the walk away. Thing, though. I mean, how is Apple doing any different? All I'm saying is in the Apple situation, there's a device. In the Google situation, there's a cloud instance and they scrubbed it and are not giving you anything. You can't even access like the spam. I can't even get access. If, if, if the North Koreans sent me a spam email with a link in it, Tag it's is going to remove that email from my account and never give me access to it. So even if I'm a, you know, I don't know, I'm an executive at a company with a massive amount of resources uh, and I can devote... $200,000 on a Mandian contract to figure out what the hell's going on. I don't have access to that information. I, I, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> buying this, this, this applause for Apple in this case. And Kostin, again, again, you get one of these things and I give it to you. I put it in your hand. What do you do? Do you have the ability to uh, properly investigate an iPhone infection, uh, pinpoint what it is and tell me what to do to like uh, re either remove it or mitigate my, like this is useless, right? Um, well, it's it's not useless in the sense that if let's 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 imagine this case uh, that someone you or me or Juan we get this notification what do you do let's say I would say the first thing you want to do is to make a backup of the phone and then to check it with uh, something like MVT like for known stuff but uh, at the same time simply having that backup in your collection will be extremely extremely valuable because uh, over time. 
as more indicators become available, you can always go back to that backup of your phone and check it. And moreover, when you move from one phone to another through these backups, artifacts, infection artifacts, they also get copied from one phone to another. So, uh, for instance, let's say my current phone might actually have artifacts from attacks which took place around 10 years ago, which is something that I think, you know, it's pretty good in the uh, Apple ecosystem, the backup, the logging, all these metadata, forensics capabilities, they are pretty, pretty good and I, I would say well understood and uh, you can leverage them in a pretty uh, effective manner to see what's going on with the phone. Uh, now, this is not a simple process. If you, again, if someone came to me and people do come to me with this uh, kind of notifications, it takes, I would say, two, three days to get them through some kind of a training program. Like, what do you want to do from, from now on? Like, okay, uh, there's your life before this notification and there is your uh, life after the notification from app. And uh, you need to change a lot of things. You need to change how you communicate. You need to change... Uh, how you use the phone, what kind of applications you have path. there. Throw the phone Your in the ocean. Path? No. <laughs> Where you um, live. <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I also recommend people is like get several other phones. It's like silly to rely just on one single phone. You need to have several phones. and uh, Have one that everybody knows and then have like uh, another one that people kind of uh, assume that you have like me here. It's like this one everybody knows I have, and this is the one that people don't know that I have, but they kind of assume that I have for secret stuff. And then I How have like know, 10, 10 other phones there in the back, <laughs> in my backpack, which nobody knows about, right? Um, now they know. Um, <laughs> and I can say that I have 15, and they will be scrambling finding those 15 phones. I can say I have 30, uh, which is all about deception. So you have to be deceptive. I think that's a lesson that you need well, to learn. Look, the, the, at that point, what we're talking about is what's, what's your goal as an individual, right? Like there, there's a couple of different, uh, you know, we're, we're really focused on the technology, and, and, and that's almost always how this works out. Like we... Um, the folks on the cyber side of things are focused on the cyber side of things. And then when you try to have a more comprehensive discussion of like, what the hell do you do because you're being targeted by a nation state, we focus on the cyber side of it. And you go, well, you know, if you throw all your phones away, you're good. And you're like, well, this is clearly a symptom of a bigger problem. You know, you're clearly doing something or involved in something that somebody is willing to spend uh, some massive resources on. So if you get rid of every phone tomorrow, we're going to be, you know, you're going to be talking about some other kind of resource being deployed against you. So the, the, that's where us being in this cyber niche and not necessarily in the broader security uh, or intelligence mentality falls very short. Uh, when, you know, we joke around because a lot of the time, you know, when we talk about security researchers being targeted, it still seems frivolous as opposed to when you're talking about activists or, or you know, politicians, NGOs, whatever, people who are doing meaningful civil society work. Uh, you expect or those people to have up. five phones and, and, and 10 mitigations <laughs> in place and five phones. That's the reality of those people's uh, lives. They can't have five phones. Yeah, it, look, you, what you're talking about is the weakness of social institutions. And that's sort of a, a, a scarier conversation to have because it, at least in the U.S. or you know some of the slightly marginally more civilized places like we we're we have other types of resources and we're hoping for certain things uh, i think the, the question gets really deflating and scary when you talk about being in india and china and some of these other places you go well what exactly do you intend to do like are you going to continue this as your lifestyle like we society wants you to would prefer that you do but we also have zero resources for you so good luck bro like it's it's grim a shout out to Catalin for noticing this, but they actually, uh, Apple actually changed the name of this thing. It used to be called State Sponsored Attacks. They're now calling it Mercenary Spyware. And this is coming yes, right uh, after the Indian government objected to some of Apple's reporting, previous reporting around stuff in India. What do we make of that? Is that just lawyers just uh, hedging and, and, or, or just following the government demands? I noticed this. And listen, I noticed this as well, like some time ago, and I wanted to bring it up. So thank you for for mentioning it. It it raises another question, which is: Are they still sending notifications about the nation state sponsored operations? I mean, Correct. the CT kind of operations, right? Again, like st stupid. Maybe it's a stupid question, but do terrorists get notifications on their phones that they were targeted with something? I don't know. Maybe they do. And if they do, 
<laughs> what do they do? Like, I'm going to drop another question. You know, maybe people will get upset that I, I'm go. dropping this question. Like, here we go. Here yeah, we right. <laughs> Did the triangulation victims get this notification from Apple or not? That's a question. I don't know. You did, the triangulation, did the triangulation <laughs> victims let Apple know? <laughs> Right, like that's the other part uh, of this thing. Where you're... They don't have to. I, uh, they don't have to because Apple, obviously, they have all the... Um, Correct. Apple um, is sending all these uh, things to all, all these all the people. Apple all accounts. these people don't know. Well, no, the no, Apple but, has but... the accounts that were uh, spear phishing everyone. So that means that Apple knows exactly who was targeted. So they have all those 60-something uh, um, Apple accounts that were involved in sending the uh, uh, exploitation uh, iMessages. Good, good, good when question, they... though. When they become aware know. of it, like the, the conversation at that point is when Apple becomes aware of certain TTPs, what do they do with the information they get? And my guess is that they will go out and notify people. But part of the difficulty here is the opacity of the Apple security space also makes it a question as to like, what are they aware of? Are they just like singularly obsessed with NSO and there's 17 other companies that are doing this and they haven't really... They're not tracking them effectively, so there's no notifications about this. Like that's where the opacity of the Apple security space is so deflating and upsetting to a lot of us. But uh, Ryan, I'll I'll give you a different answer um, on on what you were just asking, which is well, to what extent does this change in language? The fact that like Apple is moving its manufacturing from China to India for a lot of this. Because Apple, Apple acted unbelievably horrendously callously when it came to the Chinese targeting of Uyghur communities with iOS zero days. And I, like that has to, to me, that blog post of the don't worry about it, bro, you're not a Uyghur. That may have been like one of the most like the one of the lowest points in, in some of this like threat intel engagement for, you know, uh, at risk communities. But everybody understood the the rock and a hard place situation that you're in when you go, well, we're this like bajillion dollar company that that is almost entirely dependent on Chinese manufacturing and the Chinese are kind of irascible in this particular area and they're gonna they're not gonna be very nice to us about it. So you know, you we, we cut our losses, we act a little shitty and then we move on. Now you go, okay, well, the hedge against that was to move manufacturing to India. India, you know, is sort of like, as a democracy, you know, going through an interesting period. Um, so now we're kowtowing to India objecting to saying this is state-sponsored as opposed to being cyber mercenary, where the cyber mercenaries only sell to states, right? Like, But Costin asked the right question. If you're, yeah. if, you're only, if you're only notifying on mercenary operations, then the nation-state ones are not, are, are they still being notified? Or, or are people getting two separate alerting one? And again, do terrorists get this? Like if you're in Yemen, if you're an iPhone in Yemen and, 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 your, and your, ID, your Apple ID pops up there, are you getting this? I mean, that's an open question that, that's worth at least discussion. Well, I, I dare say that uh, Apple knows exactly who they're, who, whom they're notifying and nobody gets a notification unless Apple is certain that they are good people. Really? How do you know this? Like, I mean, no, you just it's, say it's this. My, it's my speculation. Ah, I this see. Is, okay. Because you, when you do these notifications, you want to do them in a responsible manner, responsible. So that means you need to know exactly whom you are notifying. So with Juan, that in mind, I think they know exactly whom <sighs> these people are. I think you that 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 gives Apple like look. I I actually we're Apple fanboys. At least Kosin and I are. Ryan's a big fan of their stock. Um, I, <laughs> I'm a big fan of you guys I, buying Apple devices. <laughs> exactly. Um, at the same time, and, and like, look, if we set aside the people we know at Apple security and look at Apple as a trillion dollar corporation with all the lawyers on earth and a view of itself as a product company as opposed to like a services company, etc., I would be incredibly surprised if that kind of discernment is making it to that discussion all at all at all as opposed to a series of reductions about well we're really narrowly focused on this activity and anyone that falls within this type of activity in this type of area is going to get this notification in an automated fashion done uh, which is also where i would hearken back to Kosin's previous question of well does that mean you're only doing this for cyber mercenaries and not uh for nations like actual nation state ops 
because that that also puts you at a place where you can discern between uh, the types of activity that you would see come out of, let's say, Five Eyes, as opposed to the kind of activities that you are outsourcing. And I, I think you can get away with a lot there. But I think we may just be reading way, way, way too much into what seems to be not that much on the part of Apple, right? Like you're still talking about a fairly small uh, subset of victims, 92 notifications, you're like, or 92 countries, even if it were 200 notifications, 300 notifications, really, that's the extent of iOS exploitation in the planet? But that's the, but that's the point Costin is making. It allows them to be more discerning. It allows them to be more careful with the ethics and perils of but pushing this. But is that this. what is happening, or are they only focused on such a narrow bucket? You're not talking about discernment as much as you're talking about cutting one eye out and just working with the other, right? I don't know. Costin, uh, you got a thought? Well, I have I have a question and people will hate me for it. Juan will hate me for this question, but I need to ask it. <laughs> so um, I'm I feel sorry in advance. Uh, but the question is, um, well, Juan works for a, a security vendor, right? So you work for uh, Sentinel One. Assuming that you guys identify, let's say, some wide cyber espionage operation with let's say a thousand victims around the world. And you have, uh, assuming you have the ability to identify um, uh, the people who were actually affected by that, would you notify everyone indiscriminately or would you first uh, vet people out and only notify the ones that, uh, let's say, you think are fair game to notify? Or do you notify, just mass notify everybody like uh, who got hit by that? Look, at the risk of copping out of your question, it's a completely incongruous situation, right? Like, my company is selling to enterprise and government clients. I am not in a situation where somebody gets to buy the product in Yemen, whom, you know, whoever they are, and, and then I'm in a, you know, kind of crummy situation of going, oh my God, do we notify this shady person in like a Houthi encampment in Yemen. somewhere, right? Like, yeah, it's like, it, that, I am not in that situation. I'm just not. Um, that said, if we want to talk about the hypothetical, which is that's where you have to stratis stratify the security vendors as opposed to like the ecosystem maintainers. And, and that, that's where I complain. You know, this is where I start complaining about Microsoft for trying to uh, present themselves as a security vendor when in reality they're an ecosystem maintainer. The questions that Apple, Google and Microsoft have to face are much broader and much more foundational than the security vendors that are tacked on top. To what extent does a, a security vendor know all of its customers when they have consumer products? To what extent um, are you really rooted in the device in a way where you get to have these questions where you go, we can see the entire spread of this operation across an entire product customer base, as in like every iPhone, not every phone that has my product, which is a subset of a subset, um, and then have those conversations. So I'm not trying to dodge it. I'm just saying it, it's a different circumstance that, that does entail a different calculus. Costin, would you, are you happy with that answer? And let me flip the question to you. You're ahead of, it, of a team. It, it, is, that, is that standard operating procedure when you're managing a research team? Um, ba listen, based on my experience, um, and um, I, I think this has been also like changing uh, in the recent years, is that when you do notifications, uh, more than uh, half of the times, they backfire. So they actually turn out quite badly. I, again, in my experience, doing notifications, um, the outcome is mostly negative, sadly. Like people don't like getting notifications, uh, <laughs> especially from a, a security vendor, if you want. Like uh, they expect to be protected. And many people, whenever they buy these security solutions, they uh, what they actually buy is peace of mind. This like they don't care about software. They don't care about your heuristics or cloud AI, uh, blockchain defense. The only thing they're buying in their minds is peace of mind. Like the fact they they gave you some money, they installed something, and then they just want to forget about the whole security um, circus, if you want. And whenever you come back and say, "Hey, yeah, well, you have a problem," like. 
yeah, that backfires. Like most of the times that backfires. Speaking of notifications, can we just pivot quickly? This week was Patch Tuesday. Obviously, there are patches from a variety of vendors, Adobe, SAP, all the ICS vendors. It's become kind of like a standard industry Patch Tuesday thing. But Microsoft, actually, let's get back to the main guy. Microsoft issued uh, patches for about 140-something CVEs, documented CVEs. Big, big, big Patch Tuesday bundle. And within there, there were two ODAs, or at least Microsoft marking two of these patches in the already de- uh, exploitation detected category. One of them is a Hyper-V OD, the other one is this MS HTML spoofing. And literally it says, this is marked as actively exploited, go patch. There's no information whatsoever in any of these Microsoft bulletins that have been scrubbed and become just kind of one-line things. How do, like, is that, is that an, am I making too much out of, of this or is that an issue where defenders are like looking around saying, am I infected? What do I do? How do I hunt for a sign of an infection? Like what, like, what is the status, status quo and how do we get this fixed? We need to buy a more expensive license. That's why we, uh, that's so why you can we don't get know what's logs? going on. No, in all seriousness, it feels like Microsoft says, hey, they have been an OD attack. This thing has been compromised in the past. Here's the patch. Go patch. Good luck. But if I'm, if I'm an organization, I want to know if am I already infected with something? Do we care? Well, uh, let's not forget Microsoft has a, uh, a special program for security vendors where uh, they share information in advance. And that includes uh, information map. about vulnerabilities. Yeah, map. Um and sometimes there's like quite valuable information in there. I, I don't know uh, in this particular case, but I can tell you that in the past uh, there were like POCs. There was quite, let's say, useful useful data that you can use to build detection or that you can use uh, to hunt in your infrastructure, trying to find for actual uh, signs of compromises. What I notice is lately is that, um, <laughs> and maybe this is kind of sad, but... Uh, whenever there's, let's say, something um, going on, like something big, right? If there's a lot of details, it's mostly, I don't know, China and or Russia or North Korea or something like that. If there's no details, you have to assume that it was not that. It was something else. So, like, that's a sad reality. Maybe I'm mistaken. Um, would be interesting to hear what our, also what our listeners think about that. But uh, that's how it looks like from the position where I am in at the moment. I I wish it were as simple as the attribution. I I think in many ways there's a there's like the the conspiracy of like oh you know is there some collusion with states that you're more comfortable with? But I think the the reality is far more banal, which is does Microsoft give a shit about a Hyper V <laughs> exploit? Do they have the yeah, time and that... resources for for any for one? Uh, instance versus the other do they wanna is it a good time for microsoft to announce a potential breach or are they going to wait until after earnings this time around like there are so many really fucking stupid but meaningful factors that get to fall out when you turn this into a question of um well in in most cases we we barely put any information out we opt in to giving more info so do we have to bother in this case, as opposed to why the hell are you telling us about active exploitation without giving us any sense of what the cluster of activity looks like, what the relevant infrastructure might have been, what, you know, it, it, could you even just point to a freaking cyber scoop article that says, yeah, this was probably related to that thing. And you go, okay, well, I'll go check over there, right? I'm not telling them that they're responsible for every O-Day on Earth, but... I'm sure they have just a little bit more context and those fucking advisories are useless. Like we are all security professionals and I read through that link and I went, I have no idea what this is. I, yeah, an attack no who successfully exploited the following vulnerability could gain system privileges. That's all you get. Like that's all you get. They mark it as uh, CVSS what? CVSS 7.8. I feel like I feel like you're just kind of like peeking at little drip droplets of information to determine your own susceptibility and... Shout out to Microsoft, by the way. I mean, just circle back and mention that since this SFI and this new push for transparency and so on, they have actually announced that big cloud bugs that they are patch, auto-patching will get CVEs. They're going to document some of the old cloud things that they, they used to just patch and say, hey, you don't have to do anything. We don't even have to document it. Now it's, it appears there's like at least some element of transparency happening. We're starting to see some energy there. Hopefully this Secure Future initiative is giving, you know, the folks at Microsoft who've been belly aching for, 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 for resources. 
but it feels like this needs to be fixed. You can't be telling people, hey, here's a piece of software. It's been exploited in the wild. Patch and good luck. I mean, like, is Map enough? Is sharing data with Map enough? Well, if it were, where is the accompanying blog by a Map subscriber that says, oh, we investigated this Hyper-V zero day and this is activity that's probably related to it. At minimum, right. Microsoft Threat Intelligence should have a blog post with at least basic detection details or so, at minimum, instead of freaking doing I mean, podcasts. Dude, you, you, you <laughs> laugh. You, you, yeah, these fucking people doing <laughs> podcasts, right? No, you laughed when I said, well, we don't have the expensive enough license, but the, the, the reality of it, maybe they have a private paid report in their Microsoft Threat Intel portal. Fuck Fair do enough. we know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Right? You're just not paying enough to know. That that may very well be the That's answer. That's a massively cynical take though. I mean, this is the no, world's largest not. this is the world's largest and most important software vendor. That can't the, be the status quo. The massively cynical it's a massively cynical business approach. It is not a massively cynical take. That is a reality that is currently happening. There is a Threat Intel subscription service behind a portal that also swallowed Passive Total, which was a service that we all relied upon. Then talk to your do talk. Then, let, then let the people know what like what the reality is in the background. It feels like you're hedging around that Microsoft may be selling this and maybe holding well, it back to sell it. I, I don't know if they're doing that, but I mean now as an outsider, I'm not I'm not privy to your world. As an outsider, now I'm hearing like okay, maybe this is a business model. This 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 stripping of the bulletins is a business model. Is that fair? I will make a suggestion um, that that thing, instead of doing a, a podcast, it kind of felt that we were shooting ourselves in the foot a bit, like fr from you, Ryan. So here's my offer. No, no, no. Like I, was, I was, with the, pod, the podcast, the podcast poke was when I, when I hear from Microsoft <laughs> Threat Intelligence, I get a podcast from them and I get some marketing material and I get how great they are, but like, there's no support. <laughs> for all day in the wild discoveries that are announced on Patch Tuesday. That was my beef about podcasts. But like, we, we are better than this. So like, here's my offer. If they send us a sample, myself, Juan, <laughs> and Ryan will analyze it, write a blog, do all that work for free, free of charge. For send free. us a sample. Correct. For free. Send us a sample. Got it. That's an open offer. But I mean, if, if, if the suggestion... If the suggestion is that bulletins have been stripped and things have been deliberately kind of whittled away, as part of some sort of business model, that's a bigger issue that needs fixing. And I hope at least this SFI takes some sort of like what? look at this thing. What I have high hell? hopes for the SFI. I don't know. I don't have high hopes for shit. But like to be honest with you, I also would point to your keynote at Echo Party like <laughs> a year ago where you, you – uh, accurately pointed out that this is a literal regression in all of the progress that MSRC had made and the, all the hard-won uh, progress that, that Microsoft had made in the security space has been getting almost purposefully rolled back for years now, right? They Correct. had this amazing relationship with the uh, with the vulnerability researchers. They had this, they, they developed this like great relationship with the security space. They, they were um, really far ahead on, on the O'Day side of things, on the Threat Intel side of things. And I'm sure they're still very far ahead on these things. But for some reason, we've been watching a systematic rollback of all of the information that was being uh, accurately put forward. And like when you talk about SFI, like I, I would have higher hopes for SFI if I also saw them summarily firing the like security leadership, quote unquote, that started to make those changes to make security a business for Microsoft, as opposed to making it a, a bedrock requirement of what they were working on. I don't give a shit that their bonuses may be imperiled, right? Like these people clearly have gone for something that has incentives that are misaligned with the prospect of having security at a company that wants to pretend to be a security vendor for two years. And, and two years later, it's going to pretend to be an AI vendor and then they will have cratered the cybersecurity space and it won't matter. Like, right, th but that's where my cynicism comes from, right? All this goodwill that I mentioned in my Echo Party keynote and the goodwill that has been lost, right, was the result of a trustworthy computing memo from Bill Gates back in the day that really systematically changed things. My, my optimism around the SFI is hoping that at least the push led by Satya all the way down will at least have us give us a post TWC. I actually predicted this memo was coming in my Echo Party keynote as well. It had, it had reached a stage where it was untenable. Microsoft could not could not possibly move forward 
And I feel like the SFI gets us to at least a pledge, at least a public commitment to do X, Y, Z things. I don't know if it's enough. I don't know how it will shape out, but I don't know. I, I would say, do you really put those two as comparable? Like I, I, I was right there with you about needing another, uh, you know, trustworthy computing memo. But let's keep in mind that that was Bill Gates, founder, CEO, coming out and saying, stop everything you're doing and take care of this until like we're not doing anything else until you guys sort this shit out and what we get now is you know charlie bell saying some nice things and satya saying some nice things followed by the introduction of copilot which people have to force them to stop followed by an announcement about the apt 29 thing which has been trickling out followed by like it's just a ser- it, it really felt like somebody in marketing said you know what worked really well for signaling our intent last time that memo but it really wasn't anyone that has a genuine, it wasn't a power move from leadership that actually said, we are not doing business as usual until we get this sorted out. That's the it public was, commitment though. The public commitment is that uh, security will take preference over features and we saw them kill Windows Recall. I mean, give them a little bit of credit. At least they, they killed didn't, it. They, they didn't, didn't have didn't to kill, kill it. it. But it came, it was announced after the SFI. <laughs> it, was, it was in tandem. It, it, it was in tandem with the SFI. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say Windows Recall must have been being built years ago. The SFI is a fresh thing. I mean, it was Windows killed Recall by is... public pressure. It was not killed by Satya saying, oh, and here's an example of what we're not going to do. Right? right. But no, what I'm saying is that the SFI gave people like, let's just, let, let, let's just say we have friends at Microsoft who we respect and we know they think along we, the same way we, we do. think. The we SFI do. gave them a lot of power internally to go up and say, hey, we cannot ship this thing. This is counter to the SFI. And there's a lot of like internal use of Microsoft folks using the SFI as like, hey, this is my clutch, right? This is how I get resources. This is how I get things changed. And I feel like you're not really giving them a fair shake. No, 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 no. I Look, that's the same that's the same mentality as to what Dave Vitell was saying with the purity pledge. The purity uh, pledge last correct. episode. Look, I am glad that we are finding ways to give support to people with way less power than they should have inside of companies to try to make change from bottom up. My problem here is that all of this saber rattling is coming from the top down for marketing. And the fact that our friends who are very competent and very conscientious have to rely on that just to try to storm the castle every time some imbecile PM decides that they're going to put a flight recorder in your computer, in every computer on earth, and that's a good security decision, like, that's still an abnegation of leadership. That's still a problem where Satya and everybody else didn't see a problem with what they were doing. Even in the midst of announcing a secure, like a foundational security initiative, I don't know. no Their kudos, defense. no kudos. Their defense, the kind of security they were thinking about was a different kind of security, not the <laughs> recall kind of insecurity, if you want. We, we are running out of time. I had a bunch of things I wanted us to get to. I don't think we will get to. Uh, I don't think we'll get to, but I want to just just have us weigh in very, very quickly on this FBI and the Allies warning about Russia using AI power, this milliliter software to create disinformation on Twitter. It's kind of Twitter specific. Um, the Justice Department took down a Twitter botnet. Is this something that we're paying attention to or is this just one of those political things that just happens and we don't care? I really like the milliliter thing. But Kosten, did you want to speak? I feel like I'm always running over you, man. Come on. You aren't. You aren't. Uh, I was like, but on on the other hand, I was thinking like, oh, Juan is starting to sound more like uh, Dave Vitale, like every episode. <laughs> so I don't know if uh, Dave infected you with something. <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, very, very, very good discussion. Uh, like the last episode, um, so I, I really enjoy that. Now, now about this, about the um, FBI notification, uh, like the the bulletins they released. I thought that was interesting in the sense that we are going to see more and more of these disinformation ops um, running, being powered by uh, large language models slash AI, uh, but at the same time, not being maybe that impactful. Like my feeling was that they were not really that impactful. Perhaps the most like the most funny thing here was um, um, who wrote to RT? Was it Chris Bing that wrote to RT asking yes, for yes, a comment? Yes. And they replied that they farming farms. is a favorite pastime 
of the of the people there. Uh, which yeah, because it was it described was as a RT folks managing and running this troll farm, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, Maybe lost costing. But I think we're gonna no. see more. We're gonna see more of them. I think the subtext. Uh, so I I look at this particular. I'm glad I read it because, uh, to be honest, if, if I had just kind of looked at the, the tear line, I might have just not bothered with it. Uh, I, the reason I read it is I saw the Cyber National Mission Force logo on it. And uh, CNMF does amazing work, like huge shout out uh, to Under Advisory and, and all the folks at uh, CNMF and General Maylock's work. When I saw that they were involved and AIVD was involved, I was like, OK, like this is something more serious than your run of the mill uh, FBI thing. Um, and I think it is. Uh, to be honest, like look at the content of what they put forth. They're saying there is a platform out there. Um, you know, you add AI so everybody pays attention to it. But there is a coordinated platform out there for this information. And um, this is how it works. This is the kind of activity they're doing. And what the subtext of all of this is, is there is no collaboration from X or Twitter or whatever you want to call it um, in any of this, right? Like, you had to have the pointy end of the spear from CNMF come out and say, hey, guys, this is what's happening. Uh, and I hope somebody at X is still there who may even bother dealing with this situation. Uh, but this is how it works. And this is the kind of activity we're seeing. And if this exists, if there's one, um, I bet you there's 20 of them that are being sold to the Russian government, the Chinese government, the Iranian government. And what we see now is... Like, I don't know, guys, if any of you have looked at the comments or the majority of the posts on Twitter, like that is the Twitter of today is the uh, like the dark markets of the late uh, 2010s, when it was just like FBI agents talking to other FBI agents. Like right now, it's just bots talking to other bots. Like there's barely any legitimate content at all. It is a complete bullshit factory. And this is not a small part of where that activity is coming from. Costin? Um, it's, it's good points. I think that the, with elections uh, coming uh, coming up, is it just like what? We have about three months left until the big elections in the States. This kind of um, announcements, they do help to, uh, with the public image. In my opinion, the public image is very important, knowing that uh, the FBI and you know the government is actually aware of these disinformation attempts of uh, attempts to influence the elections, and they are actually actually trying to shut them down. So, uh, I've always thought that public uh, perception is very important. Um, I've been calling for this. You know, we need more transparency. We need more success stories, and I think that this is what this is a a good success story of how. You know, they seize the domain, they shut down um, a bunch of accounts that were pushing uh, all these fake narratives. Sadly, it will not stop them. So just they're probably just going to register more accounts and they're going to be a bit more careful. And uh, instead of uh, registering all these accounts with the same domain, the one that uh, got seized by the FBI, they're going to start using different domains. So we know all this game. Uh, so yeah, this they will not be the end. It won't, it won't stop. Uh, probably the next versions will be more sophisticated, more elusive, which is uh, like uh, the usual. But at the same time, it's good. I, I like success stories. So it's good to, to see things like this. Speaking of the CNMF, I noticed their Twitter account has gone silent. The record actually ran a story this week saying that the malware alert system kind of fade away. What's going on there? Is there like some uh, people change that's... Uh, so I, I, uh, I loved seeing that Jason kicked the... Uh, commented on the story because that was Jason Kikta's program back when he was at CNMF, right? So, so just seeing uh, kind of kick the comment on it. Uh, look, I really like the alerts um, activity, but for the most part, I I loved it in the hopes that it was the beginning of something that could continue to grow and grow and grow. Um, and instead, it's in it the opposite some... direction. It's, yeah, it's I mean, been two uh, years since they posted the last. Uh... It it started. It was cool. <laughs> And then, uh, um, and then it waned. And frankly, I think most government activities, that's the arc that we're used to seeing. They start with a lot of momentum. They're tied to specific individuals with vision. Um, and then those individuals move around and then those things die. Um, now, maybe we can abstract from that to something a little broader, broader which is saying like, now we have all of these advisories. Have the advisories replaced 
the VT uploads? Have the advisories replaced the, the Twitter stuff? Look, the, the one we were just describing includes code and, and, um, and other technical information that would not have made it to VT and is not publicly available as far as we can tell. So they, like CNMF is finding ways to put stuff forward. I would maybe look at the other broader cadre of organizations like uh, NSA Triple C, JCDC, et cetera, and go, hey, what about you guys, right? Like who, why aren't more folks uploading actual samples and pointing us in the direction of saying, hey, we have contributed material that you can use to actually investigate this going forward, as opposed to, you know, here's a bunch of IOCs, and you go, well, thank you. That means I need to have, what, access to a, you know, however many thousand dollar virus total account just to be able to begin to play in this space, right? Like, uh, you know, there's stuff missing here. Costin, did you find a Twitter account useful? Because I remember you, you used you used to always retweet about with your attribution engine about what it what it was tied to. Uh, the fact that they haven't uh, posted one in two years, you was that a loss? Yeah, it's super sad. I thought that was like super super useful, super valuable. Um, what did you do I, with them when they posted? What, well, I mean, whenever they posted something, I would download the sample. You know, just make sure that um, it it was properly detected. I would check telemetry. I would write the other rules. So that was like the whole process. You know, um, that would would start the moment they uploaded the sample. So to me, that was uh, in in a way it was kind of um, let's say them raising the flag. Here's an important thing that everyone should be paying attention to. And uh, then, you know, everyone's just running to their labs, to their malware collections, looking for similar things. So it was super, super valuable. If you ask me, that was even more valuable than these advisories where there's like no sample. We were still like waiting for what, for like code hanger and like all, all sorts of, you know, different samples from many different advisories that were released over time for which there are no samples on, on virus total. And I'm like monitoring over 5,000. Exactly, exactly, Drovorov. Where's the Drovorov samples? I'm monitoring like over 5,000 uh, hashes of samples that, you know, never showed up on virus total uh, or anywhere else. So this else. is a people thing. Um, I, I'm guessing this is a <laughs> lawyer thing because only lawyers would look at malware that was delivered by an attacker to a victim and go, this is some proprietary shit that somebody should get their hands on. They're like, it's fucking malware, dude. Just post <laughs> it, post a zip file, post it on like malware bazaar or malshare, right? Well, like, let me let me ask the free. other question. What's the risk of posting it? I think the only situation where you could make the argument, and that's because we have this argument at AV companies, EDR companies, and so on. The only situation where you can make the argument that there's a conflict is where the malware includes. Uh, information about the victims or taken from the victims. So um, that's, I think that's the only legitimate case where you go, uh, like, this is a gray area. This is a problematic thing. I don't know that we want to dox the victim, but that it does not apply to 95% of the malware that you're dealing with, right? Like the other thing would be, hey, it, it includes a, a zero day that has not been patched or a technique that we don't want other attackers to really know. Okay, that's a that's a more nuanced conversation to have as well. But beyond that, it's fucking malware. Like there's no intellectual property that you're protecting here. It's malware. And like this is precisely like we're at the end, we're way beyond the end of the podcast. So like I'm not gonna go into this, but there is a huge failure on the part of legal standards when it comes to NDAs, incident response procedures, uh, and malware. Because there is no like I don't know who you're protecting by not providing this technical material that is needed for future investigations. Costin, closing thoughts. We got to get out of here. Closing thoughts uh, would be that, you know, in most cases for all these good or amazing things, uh, in the end, it's just one guy there who by himself decides to do that or like pushes the initiative. It's never like, you know, a group effort. It's a people with thing, yeah. It's just one person there who just pushes the whole thing and makes it happen. Shout out to Cheeseman. You know who you are. Uh, this week coming up, Juan, let's get through some promos very quickly. You're heading to SummerCon? You're speaking at SummerCon? I am speaking at SummerCon next week. What are you talking I'll about? Be... Why should the people what? show up to your talk? They shouldn't. Please don't. Uh, no, <laughs> SummerCon, SummerCon is an unbelievable conference. 
Um, and I look, I'm very forthright about this, so I, let me let me shame myself a little bit. In true SummerCon tradition, uh, my very first SummerCon talk, I, I went up there to talk about code similarity engines and how how code similarity engines work. This was like six years ago, or seven years ago. Uh, in the process of that talk, I was served about six or seven tequila shots while on stage, and it is the only time that I have blacked out on stage. One of the organizers Jesus held me up Christ. for the Q and A. So, what are you what do? well, sorry, this was seven years ago. Cut me some, cut me some slack. But like, what I'm saying is, if if the SummerCon organizers ask me to go mop the floors at SummerCon, I will do it. Gotcha. Uh, so if they ask me to come speak, I will go speak. Um, and, uh, and this will be, I think my fourth summer con talk or something like that. My intention is to go give a version of the talk I gave at the Hague Ticks, uh, about, uh, actually the failure of public private partnership. I'm still deciding just how spicy and forthright that conversation can be because they do record the talks. They do stream the talks. Uh, but I do think we need to have a, uh, a sort of postmortem and serious conversation about where public private partnership has been successful, right? Like your CNMF alerts, your advisories, your whatnot, and where it has actually been a failure um, precisely because public-private partnership is now the answer to all problems. So that's that's my intent for this conversation on Friday, Saturday. So let's see how it goes. Costin, what are you up to? Uh, just like Juan uh, who is talking uh, at summer when I'm talking to my family in vacation. So <laughs> it'll be probably <laughs> very relaxing. <laughs> Small announcement I know we made yesterday or earlier this week. Costin has joined the LabsCon program committee. So you have to be actually spending some of your vacation time reviewing these talks and helping us pick an amazing <laughs> agenda. Thank you for doing that, by the way. Thank you. Oh, and and, uh, thanks for the invite. I started already, by the way. Very good. Thank very you. good. Costin and Chris, Chris St. Myers, who has also been working quietly in the past, we were like officially added him to the program committee to recognize his work. Right, Juan? St. Myers has been actually an, an integral behind the scenes person since the very first LabsCon, so it, it's only fair that we recognize his his work and, and bring him in. Um, All right, gents, we are at a one hour and 17 minutes in, and with that, I'll say thank you very much. Have yourself a great <laughs> weekend. Best of luck next week. Costin, you're going to be back from vacation next week? I will, yes. Fantastic. We'll have better microphones all around next week, I think. That's, that's, that's the goal. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have fun. Bye-bye.